Hello everyone. Today I'm going to share about purity of heart and how to seek God. You see when when we talk of a pure heart, we speak of a heart that seeks a matter or executes a matter in, a, in whatever situation in the purest form of the heart now to have a pure heart is simply to be to do something for without hiding without hiding and doing it straight from the heart right anyone that hides the intentions of their heart they do not have a pure heart and anyone that has intentions hidden intentions or evil intentions does not have a, a pure heart well on the other hand these these people that can have a pure heart but their loyalty might be misplaced that is something and um, I can think of one name in such a situation I can think of Paul formerly known as Saul now I want to read an account I want to challenge you and I want to show you how to attain a pure heart so that you can seek so that you can see the face of God because uh, Matthew chapter 5 Matthew chapter 5 I think verse 8 Matthew 5 8 says blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God now this is a message to each and everyone out there who wants to see God and to see God you can see God in so many forms, in so many ways. You can see him in actions. You can see him, you can encounter him physically. You can encounter him in so many ways. But the thing is, so that your eyes are opened, so that you can see God around you, so that you can see the hand of God, you can see God himself. But I'm going to first give you a background about this person. And the person I'm going to teach about today is uh, Joseph. Joseph was one of the 12 um, sons of Jacob. Jacob, he was, I think, the last born. He was only 17 years when he was sold off by his brothers. Joseph had a rough life. He was loved by the father, but an outcast amongst his brethren. So out of envy, his brethren sell him out into the land of Egypt. In the land of Egypt, he, he sold into the house of Potiphar. Yeah. And now in the house of Potiphar, he was elevated and Potiphar As Joseph found favor in the eyes of Potiphar, in the sight of Potiphar. So he, he made him ruler of all his household, you know, of all his... And Potiphar was a big, was a, a big personality in, in the government or in the kingdom of Egypt, you know. Think of him as the top people after the Pharaoh. But anyways, the favor of God was upon Joseph. 
But before that, Joseph had had two dreams showing his elevation. The dreams he had shared with his brothers and his father. In fact, they had mocked him and they called him the dreamer. So Joseph, in the house of Potiphar, is accused to have to sleep with the wife of Potiphar. But what I want to talk about begins here. When she came unto him, this is what she said. Uh, Genesis 39 from verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no, there is none greater in this house than I, neither has he kept back anything from me but thee. Because thou art his wife, how then can I do this wickedness, this great wickedness, and sin against God? And it came to pass, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie by her or to be with her. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business. And there was none of the men of the house there with, within. And she called him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got, and got himself out. Joseph is falsely accused. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of the house and spoke unto them, saying, See, he has brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I cried with a loud voice. And it came to pass when he had when he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. And she spoke unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. Joseph in prison. So after that, Joseph was accused. You know, to defile the wife of Potiphar. But he didn't do it. But very amazingly, in verse 9 he said, I cannot do this great wickedness before my God. This man had a pure heart. And I believe that's why God was with him all the way. Same as King David. We can see this with all these followers of Christ, of, of God, all, all in the Bible, most of them that I have studied so far. I see the purity in heart. I see Abraham, I see Joseph. And you see, this guy said he wasn't going to do it because of God. Because, you know, it was wicked before God. It was sin against God. How many people today do things because they are sin before God? I can give you an example. One might protect themselves from immorality, right? Because they fear God. They're like, no, 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 God, he doesn't, love, he doesn't like that, it's sin. I can't sin against God. 
That is one person. The other person can keep themselves from sin, from, um, from, from immorality, because they do not want to get sick. They don't want to get involved in the, in the consequences of sickness. You know, things like, hey, I'll fall sick, uh, treatment, I'll get uh, so-and-so STD, so-and-so, you know, HIV or that. The reason why you stay righteous, the reason why you do not partake in sin, determines your, your, your purity, determines your heart. So that means this person is selfish because they don't want to get sick. Right? But the other person is pure before God because they are doing it for God. Now, oftentimes people want to meet God. They want to meet God. But when they do things, they do for themselves. I'll give you an example. One can fast. And in their fast, is to take away a certain problem in their life. They just tell you, hey, I am tired. I'm so tired of this in my life. Or I am, I just want this deal to go through. You know, I just want all this to, to, to work out for me. I pray that this goes away. So they are, they are fasting or praying away a situation. And then another person will come. And they are fasting to seek God. They're like, Lord, I pray that I pray that you forgive me. That I get closer to you, that I start hearing your voice. That I experience your presence in my life. That I turn away. That your will becomes my food and my drink. And that's the other person fasting now. Two people are fasting. One is praying away a situation and the other one is, is fasting and praying to seek God. Who do you think God is going to to work a greater job? The other one can fast and receive whatever they're seeking. But this other person that is seeking the presence of God He's going to get something far, far, far great. He's going to get every blessing that comes with knowing God. Yet the other person will just lose that situation, they get through that situation, and then another arises. Because they are not seeking the source. You understand? It's like saying, hey, um, can you please give me a headlight, a car headlight? You know, you get the headlight, fine. But the windscreen is broken. Then again, oh, can I get a, a, a windscreen? Then the side mirrors are stolen. You know, like, but then someone else comes and like, hey, Lord, um, please give me a new car. And you receive everything that's new other than fixing bit by bit by bit by bit like something that's getting dilapidated and spoiled you understand you go to the source rather than picking portions from from the source now the purity of heart and this affects our prayer life so 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 much i meet people i have met people that have wanted to seek God for the longest time. They're like, I, I just wish I have this experience with God. They're praying for an experience. They're not thinking about seeking God to know what He wants them to do, to know what His will, what His will in their life is, you know, what kind of direction God wants them to take. They're not thinking about that. But they want to have this experience to see. You understand? That person is going to be different from someone who seeks the will of God in their life. Because the one that seeks the will of God in their life is going to get to the source. He's going to see God. We can do things because it doesn't seem right. You know, you know you can 
step away from my scene because it's embarrassing. No, no, let's say, let's say something like masturbation, right? And you're like, hey, Lord, I am so tired of this. I have no peace. I can't sleep. I can't think. I'm so tired of this. Please take this out of, you know, please uh, free me from this demon. Right? You're trying to pray away the masturbation. When the masturbation goes, you are definitely going to struggle with something else. But when you seek beyond the sin, you seek the person that, that gives the power, the person that has the power, you're doing something greater. These are the things that tickle God. These are the things that, I mean, he sits down on his throne and is like, wow, this guy is doing this for me. I mean, he has set himself apart. He has consecrated himself for me. God will definitely bless you. But if you're the kind that just goes, Lord, please take away this from me. You're just not doing anything. You only go to him when, when you need a problem fixed. That is not a pure heart. A pure heart will do. A pure heart will go and help. Because God wants you to help. Not because you want a good a good name. Not because you want to feel some kind of fulfillment within. You understand? You will give. Because you're supposed to give. It's the way of a, of a Christian. You understand? Some people give because they want recognition. Some people give because they're guilty. Some people give because they want to find some kind of, some sort of satisfaction, you know, within them. But to give, you're supposed to give because God, He wants you to give. He wants you that to be your, your lifestyle. You just don't find someone hungry and you just look, you know. That is a pure heart. That it is not even about you, but God. That is what Joseph did. Because trust me, Joseph had any, every opportunity to, to lay with this lady. I mean, she, she had all the, the advantage. She was rich. She had resources. She had everything, you know, like he could seduce her and I don't know. No. And he does everything because he was a handsome young man, you know. She could have done anything for him, you know, to have a, a young man like him. But... Deep down, he knew. He acknowledged God. He was like, no, this is, this is a great wickedness before God. You know, I can't sin against God. He didn't say, you're my master's wife. I can't sleep with you because you're my master's wife. No, it's so sinful to my master. It is a sin to God. That is what he said. But then I ask myself, how many of us would survive a situation like Joseph's. What reasons would you have? What reasons would you have to survive such a, such a situation? If you look at the world today, how many people really, 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 with what you see online, with what you see people talk about, with that kind of entertainment you see people enjoy, how many people do you think would survive this situation? How do you think they would go up about it, you know? It makes me wonder. That is a pure heart. You know, God is amazing. He, he always looks out for, for the underdogs, you know. Look at Mo, uh, Joseph, he was an underdog. He was an outcast in his family, you know. He was the youngest. He was always mocked. Almost close to nothing. But see where he is in Egypt. And later on, when you read through the chapters, you see that Moses, J J Joseph was lifted up when he went to prison.
I look at Ishmael. Ishmael, um, Father Abraham's son. You know, his firstborn son. And the slave Egyptian woman. They were cast out by, by, by Sarah. She cast them out. You know? But when she was in the desert, the Lord heard her tears. And he blessed the son. He blessed her too, you know? Like, God will always bless. He will always fight for the helpless, for the weak. I look at um, Leah, the sister of Rebecca, the wife of Jacob. Like how Jacob treated her, you know, because he didn't want her, he wanted the sister. But he mistreated her, you know, and eventually God, God blessed her with children. And he closed uh, the womb of Rebecca because of the torment, the pain they were causing her heart, Leah's heart, you know. I mean, God always fights for, for the underdog. When I read things like this, I'm like, wow. Why do people sit down and argue about the Bible and say the Old Testament is irrelevant? This and that, it's useless. I often sit down and wonder, I'm like, why do people fight over, over such things, you know? It's vain. It is, it is vain. You find people into talking about the New Testament being the only the, the new covenant, the only thing we should read and follow. We should discard and throw away the Old Testament. Where in the New Testament have you found such such deep deep revelation? There is revelation in the whole word of God. But look at this, the purity of heart. How could one understand it when they when they dismiss such stories? God bless you all.